If Lexus wants to get them young, this is their best bet. Maybe their only bet. Let's drive the new 2014 IS, a 350 all-wheel drive in F-Sport trim. And check the tech. All right, spotting the new IS is pretty darn easy. Big, deep spindle grille, Lexus style. And look down at the rear quarter and see this incredible swoop that comes up off the sill and meets the outside brow of the tail lights. It's very different. It is a little bit longer. Check out that front seat leg room. I can actually put the driver's seat so far back, I can't even drive the car, which for me is saying something. Now, ordering an IS is like ordering hash browns at the Waffle House. A thousand combinations, 250 or 350. All-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, F-Sport available on any combination of the above. So what's an F-Sport? It's basically better brakes, cooler wheels, adaptive suspension, and variable steering. No engine changes. Okay, inside this new IS cabin, it's a real handsome thing. They've gotten rid of some of the needless curved organic stuff and gotten a more angular look that I think fits a sporty car. The materials have been brought up as well. Nice faux aluminum, nice whatever this machine turned finish is, and all the pleather is really good quality too. Now, in the concept version of this car, they promised us two 12-inch LCDs. Well, you know concept cars. We ended up with considerably less. There is a 7-inch main LCD right there. Navigation doesn't look a whole lot different than it has before. Slightly childish in this very kind of cool interior. They've revised a lot of the cursor work on this car. And notice when you get on top of a button, it gets this big doughy glowing thing as well. So that's a nice, simple improvement. Here at the top menu, you also see we have the Lexus app suite. A lot of things live inside there that we have seen before, no major changes. And on Lexus cars, the connection to the internet is also through your phone. It's not built in the way BMW, Audi, and soon General Motors are all gonna do it. Some of those apps show up as media sources as well, as they should in one place, thank you. Here's our iPod right here and Bluetooth streaming as well. Let's take a look at how metadata forms from our iPod, for example. This is one of the better uses of the real estate to spell things instead of rotate scrolling them, which I hate in a car. Now, these guys are known for Mark Levinson Audio. That is optional as well. And notice you've got sound profiles per source, which I think might be new in this car. So I'm setting up my iPod sound curve now. That'd be separate from my FM radio, for example. Notice in all of this, I would absolutely kill. I mean kill for a back button that isn't on the screen only. I need a button right here under my thumb. Which brings us to this haptic feedback touch thing. They call it remote touch, I think. It's like an upside down puck. It debuted in the RX a few years ago. And it's just not precise or positive enough. I think it needs to go. I'd kill for a knob with a click right now. 235 2nd Street, San Francisco, California. Two, three, five, Second Street, San Francisco, California. Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, the key two tests were passed. I can enter the address in one long phrase, not bucket by bucket by bucket, and it got it on the first try. It was kind of slow, though, doing its processing, but that doesn't distract you from driving as much as those other failings would have. Now, this layback console, I think, is genius. It's the only one I can think of in the car biz that's exactly at the angle of your fingertips when you pivot your elbow. No one else does that. It's so simple. Unfortunately, too much of it is squandered on climate control. These are your temperature thingies. Uh, they're a sensor strip. I don't need that. That's really just tech filigree. What I really want is just a damn knob, which still works better than anything else. Here's a huge gripe. What do you use more than anything except the gas pedal and steering wheel when you drive? The volume knob. This one you can never get to. Looks easy, right? Well, think about it. If you go this way, bang, your hand hits the gear shifter wherever it is. Ouch. If you try and go this way, it's this kind of tortured little twist of your wrist. If you go this way, you can't quite reach it around the gear shift. There's no easy way to get to that thing. That's a huge screw up. I'm pleased how they've done the seat heaters though. And remember, little things add up on a car when you live with it for years. Lots of these electronic switches reset every time you restart the car. What's also clever is when you get back in the car when it's cold, it automatically goes to three, which will throw you for a minute. But what it's doing, it's fast heating. And then it gradually stops itself down to the one that I had before. Well thought out, very Lexus. Now drive controls, one choice only, automatic gearbox, not a dual clutch. We'll talk about how many gears when we get to the engine bay. But it's right here with a shiftable gate here to go up and down shift 
all so you can get on the paddles. Of course, they're wheel mounted and blessedly simple personality control over here. You go counterclockwise to put it in eco mode, which you might do once in a while. Push the thing to go back to normal. Turn it once to go to sport, which is going to sharpen up transmission and accelerator behavior. Turn it again for sport plus, which will add sharper suspension and steering behavior. Now the real crowd pleaser. Let's go to the instrument panel, which they borrowed some of the technology of from the LFA supercar. And I hate to break their hearts, but it should have stayed there. Here's the trick. You push the menu button here on the wheel and whee, there we go. That gauge in the middle, which is a video gauge, moves to the right on a little motor, then exposing a whole bunch of additional menus you've got to the left of it. When don't I want to see all those menus on the left? When do I want to see less in my interface? It's not often. And I don't want my wallet within a mile of that dealership when the little motor that does this breaks. And they got to, I assume, dig all this out to get to it. No thanks. Now up here in the bow, we've got a three and a half liter V6 because this is a 350. If you get a 250, you can fill in the blanks. This V6 is sitting longitudinally, drives the rear wheel standard, drives the front wheels and the rear all wheel drive in our optional configuration here. Your transmission is interesting. If you get rear wheel drive, you get an eight speed automatic. If you get all wheel drive, you get a six speed automatic. That's what we're going to be driving today. You've got multi-port as well as direct injection on the intake side here. The logic goes that multi-port is better for cruising or idle performance, but direct injection is better when you're on the throttle. So I'm seeing a combination here, which adds some complexity, but seems to pay off. MPG, 19 city, 26 highway. 28 highway if you get rear wheel drive. 306 horsepower, 277 foot pounds of torque, gets this 3,700 pound car up to 60 and 5.7. It's a tenth slower than the rear wheel drive. You don't give up much. Okay, underway, the biggest complaint I have about this car that I share with a lot of others is a kind of sleepy, soft gearbox. The shifts are kind of slow, and this guy gets caught in its top two gears way too often, way too much. They've got a great engine note in this car as well. You can hear that. And you can even set the tack to go red when you hit a preset RPM limit. That's a lot of nice theater, but it helps to inject a certain DNA you don't think of in a Lexus. The ride is tuned towards softness, not the same precision I would expect out of, let's say, a 335 IS, but it's got a certain lack of precision at the really sharp edge. Here's the bottom line for a buyer's tip. This car, among athletic sports sedans, I think is the most comfortable riding. Not sloppy, but comfortable. And that sets it apart, I think, from a lot of the German and even American and Asian competition that tend to punish you from underneath. This car you will feel refreshed in after a long drive, if not quite as exhilarated from after a short twisty drive. Okay, let's price this guy. A 14 IS350 is going out at about 40,003. 2200 bucks or so more for all wheel drive. Note that there are some sacrifices there. You lose variable steering, you get a 14 inch bigger turning circle, and you get a six speed, not an eight speed. I'd go rear. Now, the big package that takes you totally C net style is 7700 bucks to throw everything on this car, including a few tech I didn't even show you on here. This brings the car up to 50,003 C net style. It's a fair amount of change, but this car is a nice blend of performance to the degree that you can actually use it and comfort to the degree that you will always appreciate it. 